Institute, thanks so much for being here. I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Um, and, um, and Keli Akina, the President of the Institute, couldn't be here, but he sends you his warmest aloha. The Grassroot Institute, yeah, for those wondering, is a 501c3 nonprofit educational institute that tries to educate about economic freedom individual liberty, and accountable government. And um, today we're talking about health care and why it costs so much. Now, I've always wondered um, why it is that when I spend my money on myself, I tend to spend it um, for, I try to get the highest quality for the lowest price. But uh, if I spend other people's money on other people, it's uh, reversed. I end up uh, spending a lot of, or a, a little bit of money for kind of low quality, and, um, or excuse me, a lot of money for low quality. And the same phenomenon happens in healthcare. And that is um, a topic in overcharged why Americans pay too much for health care. The book is on sale here for $15. Actually, it costs $20, but if you buy it here, it's $15. And, um, and today, we're going to hear from David Hyman and Charles Silver, the authors of the book. Uh, David Hyman is a law professor at Georgetown University, and Charles Silver teaches at the University of Texas School of Law. So. Um, why does healthcare cost so much? Won't you welcome David Hyman and Charles Silver? So, thank you, Joe, uh, and thank you to the Grassroot Institute for hosting us here. Um, when we walked in, we were wearing jackets and ties, and Charlie looked around and said, Well, we're overdressed, which is appropriate given that we're talking about being overcharged. Uh, and uh, so we managed to take off ties and got these wonderful uh, lays in re uh, response. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, uh, sort of bouncing back and forth, about a book that we wrote that was published last year um, that you've already heard the title of, and you can see it up here uh, on the slides. And uh, we thought we would sort of uh, frame it by just showing you a short video that was made to promote uh, the book. So the, the point of the book, uh, and in some ways uh, of the opening video, is we have this example of a bag of saline, which is basically water and salt. Uh, and it doesn't get more simple than that. Uh, and on a retail market, you could buy this for basic cost pennies to manufacture, and you can buy it for a dollar or two. Um, but it turned out uh, the federal government and the state Medicaid programs were paying $900 a bag for this stuff. Um, and that's just a sort of tip of the iceberg of the ways in which people are overcharged. Um, and so let me just talk briefly about the organization of the book and then show you some newspaper headlines uh, to sort of frame the issues that we're going to be talking about. Um, so the basic structure of the book, it's two parts. The first part is diagnosis. We sort of lay out uh, all of the differing uh, areas in which uh, the healthcare system costs a lot of money and doesn't seem to be delivering particularly good value, um, including doctors, hospitals, hospice, um, surprise medical bills, a subject we'll have a little bit more to say about in a few minutes. Uh, and then part two focuses on treatment. And this is sort of, I'm a physician as well, and this is very much the way in which doctors approach problems. They start by asking, what are the symptoms? What's the diagnosis? And then what's the sensible treatment? Keeping in mind the sort of side effects that you need to worry about uh, and the trade-offs associated with varying treatments. And so we have eight chapters in the second part of the book that cover everything from pharmaceuticals, which turn out to be a pretty hard problem to, pick, to fix in certain respects, uh, to retail medicine, uh, medical tourism, uh, and the way in which we individually and collectively think about healthcare as being like and unlike other parts of the commercial marketplace. Um, so let me just give you a couple of examples. These are drawn from the last four months or so. Uh, this is a uh, family was at the gas station and the eight-year-old daughter was trying to uh, learn how to use the gas pump. Uh, her eyes get splashed with a little gas. Uh, they take her to the hospital. Uh, and the hospital charges them $800 to use the sink, not the eyewash station, which is broken, but the, the local sink. And then they get a bill for 800 bucks. And you sort of go, really? 
How did that happen? Well, that's modest, $12,000 for a bee sting, right? Um, this is a, a couple visiting from South Korea who go to San Francisco. Uh, they're uh, uh, basically toddler falls off the bed, won't stop crying. They take them to the local emergency room. Um, and I won't tell you who it's named after, but it's a tech executive and it rhymes with Schmuckerberg. Uh, <laughs> all right, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, so they, they didn't do much for the, the child, right? They gave him a, a, a blanket, a nap, and a bottle of formula, and it was all out of network, and so the bill was $18,000, okay? Um, and then this is a public school teacher in Austin, Texas, where uh, Charlie is from. He had really good insurance, right? Public school teachers, by and large, have exceptional insurance. He had a heart attack. He got taken to the local hospital. Uh, didn't have any choice in where he went because it was an emergency. He got a bill for $150,000. His insurer said, we think that's outrageous. We'll pay $50,000. You're on the hook for the rest of the money. So he had a basically a $110,000 bill. Um, things have gotten so out of hand that Utah, which is a you know, pretty conservative state, has told its state employees, if you have, are taking one of these expensive drugs, you have a choice. You can either stay here at home and the local pharmacy will dispense it, or we'll pay for you to fly to San Diego, we'll drive you across the border, you'll pick up your medication there, you'll come back across the border, you'll get to spend the night in San Diego, we'll pay you $500 for your trouble, and the state will still come out tens of thousands of dollars ahead, simply because they had paid vacations for people to go get their pharmaceuticals elsewhere. So this is a sort of indication of the severity of the overcharged problem. And these are not outlier anecdotes. This is sort of absolutely representative of what can happen to even well-insured people when they go to an out-of-network facility. So now let me switch over to Charlie, who's going to talk more about pharmaceuticals. about that? There we go. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to thank the Grassroot Institute for having us here. And uh, despite Joe's uh, opening remarks, I want to assure the Grassroot Institute that we have spent the money they provided us very wisely. Um, how could you not spend money wisely here in Hawaii? Uh, anyway, uh, the picture on your screen now, how many of you have seen this fellow before? Uh, the picture on your screen. We have one or two. This is uh, the famous, okay, the famous or infamous Martin Shkreli, who um, uh, became uh, the most hated man uh, in America because when he took over uh, the manufacturer of a drug called Daraprim, uh, which is a treatment for toxoplasmosis, a uh, disease suffered mainly by people with compromised immune systems, uh, he raised the price from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill. Um, and uh, he became so uh, reviled uh, that um, he once held a charity auction for the right to punch him in the face. And he boasted of having gotten an offer of $78,000 for the right to punch him in the face. And I think we can all kind of see why. Uh, Shkreli, wa when Shkreli did this and attracted so much attention, the rest of the pharmaceutical industry sort of pilloried him. They said, oh, he, you know, he's one bad apple and the rest of us are good corporate citizens. We would never do anything like that. But the, the fact of the matter is that what Shkreli did was absolutely uh, common in the pharmaceutical industry. As you'll see, the, uh, the, 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 the way the pharmaceutical industry plays this game is they get a monopoly on the supply of drugs and then they exploit the monopoly in the same way that any person holding a monopoly uh, would. And then they offer uh, excuses for what they did in an attempt to uh, cover or deflect attention from themselves. Uh, oh, so here's a list of uh, 
of drugs that uh, had their prices raised. The top ones are generics, and you can see Colchazine, which is a treatment for uh, gout, went from nine cents a pill to four dollars and eighty-five cents a pill after um, uh, a company called Colchris, I believe, uh, gained a monopoly on it. And then there are a bunch of other drugs. Most recently in the news has been insulin, which is creating a nationwide crisis because it's made by only three companies and it, acting in lockstep, they have raised the prices uh, quite dramatically to the point now where lots of people with diabetes cannot afford to take their insulin as often um, as they should. Uh, next slide, David. Uh, wait, we missed one. Where it is? Did. There it is. Here we go. Uh, the, uh, the attempt by the, uh, the drug uh, makers to deflect attention from themselves, they've come up with a variety of ingenious uh, reasons. Typically what they say is they need to raise the prices in order to support research and development of new drugs. Well, in Ciccarelli's case, there was no research and development of new drugs taking place. And in later interviews, Ciccarelli was quite candid saying, look, my shareholders expect me to make the most profit that I can. Of course, he was the biggest shareholder in Retrofin, the company that was making the drug. So what he was really saying is, I expect myself to make the most profit possible. But he's not the only one who's come up with ingenious reasons here. Uh, a company called uh, Nostrum Laboratories, I doubt that you can read this, recently raised the price of an antibiotic by 400%, from $475 a bottle to about $2,400 a bottle. Uh, when asked uh, why the price went up, the chairman, the CEO of the company said, I think it is a moral requirement to make money when you can, to sell the product for the highest price. So now it has become moral to do what is in your self-interest. Uh, quite a perversion. Um, okay, so, uh, We've talked about there being uh, an established game that the uh, pharmaceutical makers uh, play, uh, and uh, it's far from the only problem with our healthcare system. Uh, we, in the book, cover the laundry list, the waterfront of problems with the healthcare system. Really, if you want a comprehensive review of the problems and their causes, I honestly think you cannot do better than to read our book. But for example, we cover uh, open-ended reimbursement for patented pharmaceuticals, excessive use of medical treatments, providers' conflicts of interest, the routine delivery of treatments that are either ineffective or of unproven effectiveness. And you'd be shocked at how many treatments fall into uh, that category. Um, charges that bear no relation to cost, which uh, 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 occur throughout um, the system, surprise medical bills, and widespread uh, quality problems. And then finally, we look at the political side, uh, the political economy of healthcare, and look at things like political corruption and the influence of corporate money on our healthcare system. David? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk now about that uh, ocean of fraud. Um, those of you who sort of read the newspapers are probably familiar with the sort of litany of uh, stories about fraud, waste, and abuse in the healthcare system. We collected a bunch of them here, and the striking thing is everywhere you look, whatever sector of the healthcare system, uh, you will find examples of fraud and abuse and separate examples often of wasteful practices involving companies that are sort of household names, large drug companies, um, local pharmacies uh, and pharmacy chains, uh, academic medical centers, local hospitals, um, doctors, ambulance services, and you can sort of, I, I don't know, if, can people read the bolded print there in the back of the room? I won't go through everything, um, but basically over and over again what you see is every part of the healthcare system has a fraud problem. Uh, every year or so the government announces we're cracking down on fraud and they indict a bunch of people and send some of them to jail and announce record fines and then the next year there's another set of press releases that basically say the same thing. We're cracking down on fraud, we're taking it very seriously. The problem is there's a sort of game of whack-a-mole going on. There's so much fraud that everywhere you look you can find it and that's indicative of a broader problem with how we're paying for health care. The last one on the lower right uh, that you may not be able to see is organized crime. Right? It turns out the mob has decided that it's actually uh, much more lucrative 
to be in uh, the fraud game, healthcare fraud game, than their traditional lines of business. I'll show you uh, a, a quote from Louis Free, the former director of the FBAI back in 1995. Cocaine distributors in Southern California and South Florida are diversifying into Medicare abuse because the profits are greater, the chance of detection is slimmer, and the penalties are minor. I'd also mention that when you knock on the door of people who are committing health care fraud, they have a fixed address, sometimes, not always, and they don't meet you at the door with semi-automatic weapons, unlike, say, drug dealers. Um, and so, you know, it, it's in some ways, there's a sort of cat and mouse game that's going on where it, it's a business for everybody that's involved. Um, let me give you an example of how it's a business. This is a slide that's probably a little hard to see in the back of the room. Uh, Walgreens, how many people have heard of Walgreens, right? A major company. This is not some fly-by-night, low-life, uh, hit-and-run company. Discovered that if they changed the pills that they dispensed when someone came in with a prescription for Zantac. How many people have heard of Zantac, right? Very common drugs, now over the counter. It used to be prescription only basis. Um, the way in which this particular scheme worked was the government realized because Zantac had gone generic that if it, it could impose a price ceiling on this, the amounts that it would pay when Zantac was dispensed and they wouldn't pay any attention to what the list price was that the drug company had set. When they don't have that ceiling, there's a sort of standard statutory formula. They take whatever the list price is, and then they subtract a little bit, and then they write a check for that amount. Well, some enterprising people discovered that there was a cap on one form of Zantac, that is, on the form that was dispensed as tablets, but not on the form that was dispensed as capsules. Exactly the same drug, right? It was just a difference in the way in which they were packaged and people swallowed them. And so they went to Walgreens and said, you know, if you switch from dispensing tablets to dispensing capsules, you'll make a lot of money because there was a price ceiling on one and not on the other. And so guess what? It's like suddenly the demand for one of them plummeted and the demand for the other skyrocketed. Well, that in fact was not what happened. Walgreens was just auto-dispensing capsules instead of tablets when people came in with a script. And they did that for more than a year, and then suddenly the things reversed. How many people think that the drugstore suddenly developed a conscience? Right? Got one person, right? What happened was somebody filed a whistleblower complaint. The lawyers got involved and said, yeah, maybe you should not continue to pile up your damages by perpetrating this particular scheme. So this is, you know, a reputable company that saw an opportunity and took it. And it's indicative of the broader sets of problems with our healthcare system. Uh, so, but they're also bad actor people, right? Some of them with medical degrees. This is Dr. Jacques Roy. He practiced primary care in Texas. He took the federal government for almost $400 million by certifying people for home health care that didn't actually need home health care. Many of them didn't actually receive home health care. But the signed doctor slip was enough of an excuse for the billings to take place even if the services were not actually being provided. He was the number one certifier of patients for home health care. 11,000 patients over six years, 5,000 in a single year. The average physician certifies one to two people a month for home health care. A little more often if they're uh, geriatric practice, but nonetheless, this is not all that common. If you look, he sticks out like a sore thumb, but nobody was paying any attention. They just auto-paid every single time there was a bill for home health care. He finally ends up suspended in 2011, but that doesn't stop him. He just keeps filling out the paperwork, and the services still keep getting paid. He's finally convicted in 2016, and the book is full of examples like Dr. Roy. Now let me show you another example that involves uh, an important subject, that ends up showing how the government uh, payment systems can cause problems. So wet meat macular degeneration is a disease that can cause blindness in the elderly. Um, Avastin was a drug that was developed for the treatment of uh, colon cancer. It turned out to be extremely effective in treating wet macular degeneration. If you injected a very small amount of it into people's eyes, it basically stopped it completely. Um, 
And so what happened was the company that manufactured Avastin realized that it was basically not making as much money as it could if it developed a drug that could be exclusively limited to ophthalmologic treatment. So it developed an identical drug called Lucentis. It was just packaged in a different way, much smaller doses. If physicians used Avastin, the way in which the reimbursement system was set up, they would get 6% of the drug cost, but the drug dose cost you can see is $60 per dose for Avastin, $2,300 per dose for Lucentis, even though the drugs are identical. Many physicians continued to prescribe Avastin. Some doctors switched to Lucentis. They made more money for doing so. The Medicare program paid out much larger amounts for each and every physician that was using Lucentis, even though the patients were getting effectively the exact same treatment. Studies had shown it was exactly the same. So far, fine. This is just your garden variety misbehavior. But now, let me introduce you to Dr. Melgan. Dr. Melgan's a South Florida ophthalmologist. He was paid $135 million by Medicare for quadruple billing for Lucentis, right? He picked the more expensive drug and then he quadruple billed for it. And he also had unnecessary treatments. Basically, everyone who walked through the door, he said, you've got wet macular degeneration, and he started injecting them. And what happened, the Medicare program just kept writing checks, check after check after check. Eventually, some people wised up and said, we're a little concerned. We think you're over-treating people. We'd like you to pay some back some of the money, but you can keep treating patients while we're sorting this one out. Dr. Melgan said, fine, and he found a United States senator, a senator from New Jersey, that to go to bat for him. He paid him a million dollars in campaign contributions, and Guess what? The senator did everything you can imagine to lean on the government agency that was responsible for continuing payment to Dr. Melgan. And we've reproduced for you at the bottom a transcript from a phone call that the chief of staff for Senator Melgan made to someone at the agency that was responsible for evaluating this. So one federal employee calling another and the statement on the record was, bad medicine is not illegal, Medicare should pay these claims, i.e. claims for bad medicine. Just think about that, right? One federal employee is telling another that that's how we ought to run things. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about surprise medical bills. Um, can I just ask, how many of you have gotten a surprise medical bill or know someone who has? Okay, so that's, you know, indicative of the breadth of the problem. So let me turn things over to Charlie. Okay, so surprise medical bills are, uh, generally speaking, bills that patients don't expect to receive. More particularly, they're bills that patients get after their insurers have already paid whatever it is that their insurers are going to contribute. Um, surprise medical bills were actually the number one concern of Americans during the 2016 election. So healthcare itself was the number one issue among voters in the 2016 election and within the area of healthcare, concern about unexpected medical bills was the number one issue with uh, over 60% of people saying that they were very worried or somewhat worried about receiving um, these bills. So the question is, why do we get these bills? Uh, why do these bills uh, uh, pop up in healthcare when we don't see them anywhere else? The uh, analogy we use is to an auto body shop. So a hospital is a body shop that works on your human body. And a body shop is a repair shop that operates on your car's body. Uh, you will get a surprise medical bill, if you are unlucky, from a hospital, particularly from being treated in an emergency room, but surprise bills can come from anywhere when you're treated in a hospital. Very commonly, for example, people go into a hospital thinking the hospital's in network, and then six months later they get a bill from the anesthesiologist that they did not expect. Why? Because it turns out the anesthesiologist is neither on the hospital staff, not an employed physician, nor in the same network as the hospital. I experienced this myself. Um, I was uh, about to be prepped for uh, a minor surgery, and uh, I asked the anesthesiologist, um, how much is this going to cost? And he looks at me and says, I don't know. 
that's dealt with by the people in our front office, right? And I said, well, in my insurance network, he said, I don't know, I'm the anesthesiologist, I can't answer these questions. So in healthcare, it's very difficult to find out the information that you need to know. And of course, the first time I was meeting the anesthesiologist was right before the surgery. So if I had said, well, I don't want to be treated by you not knowing anything about the cost, I would have had to forego the, the surgery at that time, which would have been a major problem. So of course, I went ahead and did it. And fortunately, it worked out okay. But you, you get the point. We do not see uh, surprise medical or surprise bills anywhere other than in hospitals. So why can auto body shops not do that? If you took your car to an automobile body shop after getting in a wreck, and you got a bill from the body shop, and then six months later, you got a bill from the guy who painted the fender that was separate. How would you react? You would, you would be what? laughable, you'd laugh. You'd think this is absurd, right? You, you guys, you combine all of the services into one bill and then you bill me for that. And moreover, surprise bills, meaning bills that exceed what the insurance company will pay, are very rare. Uh, and you know about them in advance if they're going to happen. And of course, for example, you know you have to pay your deductible, right? That's part of your business, you know that in advance. but. Uh, you know, an auto body shop that tried to do this stuff would be out of business very quickly because you would tell your friends not to go there. People would post uh, uh, on social media saying this is a crappy shop. Can you believe they did this to me? And so pressure from consumers to charge reasonable amounts and to combine all the services into a single bill would make it quickly impossible for any auto body shop to engage in this practice. But for hospitals and healthcare, uh, that kind of pressure doesn't exist. Consider an emergency room uh, physician sending out a balance bill. Is there any risk that the balance bill will cause the emergency room doctor to lose business? No, because people don't go to emergency rooms on the basis of price. They don't shop. Uh, they don't even know anything about the emergency room doctors before they show up. Nobody goes there to see their favorite doctor. You meet your emergency room doctor for the first time when you show up. And so they're kind of guaranteed a flow of patients, so they don't have to care about balance bills. The hospital anesthesiologist who sends you the balance bill doesn't care either because the person who controls the flow of patients is the surgeon, the person who brings in the patients. The anesthesiologist is a needed part of the team and so is guaranteed work as long as the surgeon keeps bringing in the patients. And so what we see in healthcare is extremely consumer unfriendly billing practices that persist nowhere else in our economy. And the problem is to understand why. We've got one more uh, uh, slide uh, movie to show you about another bill, but will the sound work? We're gonna have to skip it. Well, this one is entitled, There's Gold in That Urine. And if we did show it to you, it would describe the, it, the case of a young woman who had recovered from back surgery. Uh, and uh, when she came out from back surgery, they had given her a prescription for opioids. A year after the surgery, she goes to the same doctor for a checkup and is told everything is going fine. And on the way out, the doctor asks her to leave a urine sample, apparently in some desire to check whether the drugs are still in her system or something like that. So she does unthinkingly as she walks out. And then uh, about six months or a year later, she gets a bill for $15,000 for a urine test uh, from a lab that is out of network. Her insurance company said that had, she been, had the lab been in network, they would have paid $100 for the urine test. But instead, this lab charged her $15,000 because it was out of network. Her father, who was himself a physician, uh, then went to bat for her and argued with the testing facility and got the bill down to a mere 5000 which he paid in order to protect his daughter's uh, uh, credit rating. So yes, urine can be a source of great profits. In fact, if you tally up all the amount of money that is spent on urine tests in this country, it is tens of billions of dollars. It is a remarkably profitable um, industry. I, I should tell you that the videos that we're unable to show you, um, you can watch on the website for the book, uh, overchargedforhealthcare.com, 
we have the two videos that we're not going to be able to show you. Okay, so the next slide uh, asks the basic question. Oh, you'll have to yeah, skip that one. Um, why is our healthcare system so dysfunctional? Why is it so unfriendly to consumers? And the first problem is third-party payment. That's the problem that Joe mentioned at the beginning. We, when we go to get healthcare, we typically do not spend our own money. We rely on third parties, which may be insurance companies, or it may be Medicare, it may be Medicaid, it may be TRICARE if you're in the military, but we rely very heavily on third parties to pay our bills. In fact, uh, at, at, at the point of sale, the average patient pays something like 11 cents on the dollar for healthcare. So about 89 to 90 cents on the dollar is coming from a third party payer, whereas a very small fraction is coming from uh, the patient. And that tells us that we're using insurance in the wrong way. Uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean, insurance when it works well, covers catastrophes. Uh, people here own homes, right? So you know that your homeowner's insurance doesn't pay for ordinary upkeep on your house. It doesn't pay to put a new roof on your house. It doesn't pay to repaint your house. It doesn't pay to upgrade your kitchen or anything like that, right? It pays if your house is struck by lightning and catches fire and burns down or if it's flooded or if there's a major catastrophe, right? It pays off in those kinds of situations which are characterized by low frequency, low likelihood of occurrence and high costs. They have extremely catastrophic consequences. That's where insurance works really well because insurance can spread the costs of catastrophes across a large population, each of whose members pays a very small amount with the expectation that very few people in any given year are going to have claims, but not in healthcare. In healthcare, we use insurance to pay for everything. So how many of you have gone to see a doctor and when it comes time for your copay, just pulled out your insurance card and said, here it is. I guarantee it's everybody, right? Everybody does that, right? Well, a typical doctor's visit might cost a hundred bucks. There is no other part of the uh, economy in which we use insurance to pay for things that cost a hundred dollars. Some of you have probably gone out to dinner and spent a hundred dollars and you didn't use insurance to pay for your dinner. You paid for it yourself. But we are in the habit of using insurance in the healthcare system to pay for everything. And that is not what insurance is designed to do. And in fact, when we use it that way, it corrupts our judgment because it removes from consideration the thing that normally keeps prices reasonable, which is our desire to get high quality at low cost. So we no longer shop around for healthcare because it doesn't pay. We pay 35 bucks in our copay regardless of what the doctor's charge is. And so the incentive to shop um, is gone. And then we have a problem with the next uh, click, please, of political control of healthcare. One more click, please. Um, we encourage spending on healthcare in a variety of ways, and we have a variety of political constraints on competition that enable providers to charge whatever they want. So, for example, the tax subsidies for healthcare uh, consumption are the biggest subsidies that we have. They're bigger than the subsidy, uh, the tax uh, subsidy for home mortgage interest uh, by itself. The uh, exemption for dollars paid out of uh, workers' income, salaries, for insurance offered through their employers uh, swamps everything else. That's like a $200 billion a year uh, tax subsidy. Well, when you give people tax subsidies for paying for things, you encourage them to use those things. People now want their employer-provided health care to be as comprehensive as possible because that's how they maximize the value of the tax exemption for the pre-tax dollars that they use to pay their employer's premiums. So you're encouraging consumption and it's a simple law of economics that when you stimulate demand, the price will increase. We also have mandates in the insurance system on what insurance has to provide and those mandates often cover things that are small. Um, uh, we have limits on market entry. I don't know about Hawaii, but many states have significant limits on the ability to open up new hospitals, for example. Is, that one of, is Hawaii one of them? You're saying yes. Well, when you limit entry, then you create a context in which monopolies exist 
and monopoly providers can charge higher prices. So uh, it shouldn't be surprising why we have uh, a system that uh, eats up more and more money uh, every day. And then lastly, we have this uh, uh, corrupt relationship. Uh, one more click, please. We have a corrupt relationship that runs in both directions, and this is the example that Melgan points out. We have uh, political control of the healthcare sector, which makes it profitable for physicians and hospitals, et cetera, to work in that sector because the po politicians direct them uh, a flow of money, right, through Medicare, through Medicaid, through other programs. What's their interest? The interest of the recipients is, hey, we want the flow to get bigger and bigger every year. And so what do they do? They take some of the money that they earn every year and they feed it back into the political system through lobbying, through campaign contributions, et cetera. The healthcare sector and the insurance sector are just enormous contributors to uh, the American political system. So they pay the politicians, in effect, to direct ever larger flows of money into their coffers. And this is a perverse system that just keeps feeding on itself. It corrupts the delivery of health care because the doctors and hospitals are no longer concerned about what's doing best for the patient. They're concerned about doing whatever will generate checks from third-party payers. That could be delivering treatments that don't work, delivering treatments like PSA tests to men in their 80s when they have no benefit at all from taking these tests. It can be uh, cancer screens for women, for mammography for women in their 70s and 80s when they're not going to benefit from these tests. It could be end-of-life intensive surgery that has no prospect of helping the patient and will actually harm the patient probably by shortening the patient's life, but it all gets paid for, right? So the political control of healthcare corrupts healthcare and the medical control of politics corrupts politics that works in both directions and preserves the system that we have. David. So we're now going to pivot and talk a little bit about first Medicare for all uh, or single payer and why we don't think that that's an effective solution to the problems that we've outlined. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we do think is a likely solution and we should be able to leave 10 to 15 minutes for questions if you have them. We'll also be happy to stay around afterward if you want to buttonhole us individually. Um, so the, the book has an entire chapter entitled uh, Blind Place and Lost Causes about things that people talk about that we don't view as a likely effective solution. The number one uh, on that list in our view is single payer. Um, and so we, you know, we'll only have time to give you a sense of the broader chapter, but let me sketch out some of the arguments uh, right here. First of all, it's important to ask yourself by single payer, what do we mean, right? Which single payer will show up? Is it Medicare for all? Is it Medicaid for all? Is it the VA for all, right? And each of these three programs is structured very differently. They serve very different populations. They score differently in terms of public regard uh, and affordability. Um, how many people have seen scandals involving the VA? Okay, so do you want VA for all? Um, I think we, we, we should do a lot to improve the quality of care that's delivered by the VA, and there's no question about that. The book talks about that. But thinking about spreading single payer, I think you should ask, well, which of these three programs that are currently in existence do we think is the single payer that's going to show up? A, a second important issue about single payer is it's going to result in very high on budget costs. The most optimistic estimate um, by the proponents uh, of this thing is that it will result in 33 trillion dollars in new, new spending on health care. That's against a current sort of spending of you know 2.5 to 3 trillion a year. So we're basically going to be doubling our spending. Um, in terms of the share of the GDP, we're talking 18 to 20 percent. And if you look at total taxes received by the federal government currently, that's about what it's currently taxing us collectively at around 20 to 25 percent of the GDP. So we're looking at very dramatic increases in on budget costs, very dramatic increases in the taxes that will be necessary to fund them. And I think although advocates are more than enthusiastic about doing just that, we have, you know, three states, all of them sort of blue states, that have looked at single payer and gagged when it came time to 
actually enact legislation that would impose the taxes that were necessary to fund it. So Vermont, California, and Massachusetts have all flirted with single payer, but when push came to shove, they all backed away. So the question that we want to flag is, well, if those three states aren't willing to do it, do we really think that we'll be able to do it collectively at the federal government and impose it on states that have very different politics than these three? Um, and now let me turn to lead back to Charlie about a, a sort of absolute classic argument in favor of why Medicare for all is a good idea. Charlie. This, this argument is a little technical, but I bet you all have heard the basic claim. The basic claim is that Medicare for all will save money because Medicare is more efficient than private insurance. Has anybody heard this claim? Maybe people are, are laughing already, but the claim is out there. In the book we cite sources, uh, Senator Sanders uh, has predicted something like $6, trillion, or sorry, $6 trillion in savings over 10 years. Uh, uh, First of all, you know, I hear from people chuckling that people are generally suspicious of the idea that the government does things efficiently. And I, I think that's probably a good attitude uh, on your part. But if you want to get technical, the analysis that's given in support of this assertion is just deeply, deeply flawed. So the way this works is they take the total budget for Medicare, which would be about $700 billion uh, this year, and they use that as the, de the denominator. The, device, the uh, numerator is what they call administrative expenses, which is about um, 30 some odd uh, billion this year. So then they come up with a number and they say, ah, oh, Medicare's administrative cost is two to three percent. That's very efficient and private insurers by contrast are uh, at 14, 15, 16 percent. So we would save all this money by having Medicare for all. Um, as you think about this measure of efficiency though, what you should realize is it is quite simply garbage. It is not at all a useful measure of efficiency. So remember what I said, it's administrative cost divided by total budget. Suppose we could take Medicare and make it grossly more inefficient by doubling what it spends on products. So we leave its administrative expenses at their current $30 billion level, but we increase the total budget to 1.4 trillion, doubling it, because they just pay twice as much for all the services that they currently get. Any sensible measure of efficiency would make Medicare look less efficient then, right? Because it's overpaying for everything by 50%. But if you look at the ratio, what happens? Medicare looks better because now it's got 30 billion in administrative costs, but it's got a divisor of 1.4 trillion. So now administrative costs, instead of being two to 3% are one to one and a half percent. It looks more efficient even though it's acting dumbly. Do it the other way. Suppose Medicare could uh, figure out how to provide all of the services that are currently provided for at half the current cost, right? Instead of 700 billion, it's 350 billion. Well, that should make Medicare look a lot more efficient, right? But the ratio goes the other way. Now it's 30 billion divided by 350 billion. And so you're up, what, at the 5% range, 4 and 5%. Um, so the, the measure works exactly the opposite of the way that it should. What would we really like to see as a measure of efficiency? What we would like to see is how much money does Medicare spend to deliver one dollar in appropriate health care to a person who needs it? How much does Medicare spend to deliver a dollar's worth of appropriate health care? Well, when you do the math, using only the amount of fraud that there is in Medicare, what you find is that Medicare is grossly inefficient. So there are different estimates of the amount of fraud in, med in the Medicare system. The government says it's 10% of all of the money that Medicare spends. Now, by the way, that should shock you, right? Because at a $700 billion budget, 10% is 70 billion taxpayer dollars a year that are being lost to fraud, waste, and abuse. That's our money, right? But it's going to criminals, basically. Uh, so what's the efficiency rate if we assume that the other 90% is 
used to pay for good health care. Well, now the ratio is 70 billion plus 30 billion in administrative expenses, so that's 100 billion, divided by uh, 600 billion. The total budget is 700 billion. So you've got 100 billion divided by 600 billion, that's one sixth. Uh, 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 a ratio. That's not a very good ratio. Other measures of, other people who have studied waste and abuse in the system put the estimate at 30% of Medicare's budget. That means that out of 700 billion, 210 billion dollars is lost. So if you assume that the other, let's say, 500 billion is still spent on good health care, now you're at two-fifths of it being just waste. I mean, this is an incredibly inefficient system. It is not a good system, and we do not want it for everybody. David? So, Joe, do we have five more minutes to finish up, or? Okay, so let's, um, well, so let me uh, quickly just flag, obviously other countries have single payer uh, in varying degrees and varying degrees of success or unhappiness or happiness with them. And so an obvious question is, well, if they can do it, why can't we? Uh, the chapter includes some discussion of that. Uh, the, the quote at the bottom, I think, reflects our attitude that, and our conclusions that compared to governments in other countries, our government is much more susceptible to special interests and it often behaves as though it's run by idiots. Um, and so, you know, that, that I think is a, a complication that, that we need to take seriously. So the, let me uh, just sort of switch to the what should we do sets of issues, and then we'll show you briefly an example or two, and then we'll wrap it up. So our, our conclusion is that it's very important that we focus on making health care cheaper, right? The reason why health insurance is expensive is because health care is expensive. And rather than focus on trying to provide health insurance to people, we should do all sorts of things to make health care cheaper, which will take a lot of the pressure off of insurance costs and also make insurance less necessary for the kinds of small dollar services that Charlie was talking about. So the keys, we think, are encouraging market entry and competition, relying more heavily on self-pay, reserving insurance for true catastrophes, the sort of things that your homeowner's insurance is designed to protect you against. For branded pharmaceuticals, we think prizes are likely to be a more effective strategy than our current. We'll give you a patent, we'll give you an exclusive right, and then just tell us how much you want and we'll pay it. That hasn't worked before. We can't see how it can be made to work. And for generic pharmaceuticals, which Charlie showed some examples of, we think FDA reform is going to be a very important strategy. We think we should exploit federalism. Different states have different preferences, priorities, resources. We ought to let them go their own way, much more so than we've done previously. And we think we ought to fix the tax subsidies. You, you, if you think we're spending too much on health care, you shouldn't create incentives for people to spend money on health care. Um, and if we're going to subsidize people, which we think you should, we should subsidize them by giving them money and letting them spend it on things that they value, rather than giving them coverage that they often don't value. David, so. let me quickly run them through our retail healthcare stuff. And then we'll stop. So what do we think the future looks like? The future looks like healthcare being sold the same way everything else is sold, through retail outlets where there's competition at convenient hours and uh, consumer-friendly service. Uh, there are lots of retail clinics now and people uh, get uh, good pricing information at them. Uh, we put up a link here for the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. If we had time, I'd take you to their website. It works as simply as you could imagine. You go to the website, it has a picture of a human body on it. It's, you pick the body part that needs the surgery, like you pick your knee for a knee replacement. It tells you exactly what the price is. And why does it work that way? because they don't deal with insurance. They work on a cash basis. Sometimes they work with employers who just pay for their employees to have treatments, but they don't deal with um, insurance companies. There are lots of innovations taking place right now at the retail level. You're hearing about some of them. You know that CVS Health, for example, is uh, ramping up its minute clinics. You know that Walgreens is competing with them, that Amazon and, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name, 
Warren Buffett's company and Jamie Dimon's company have formed this new consortium. Uh, Apple is delivering healthcare through watches. We're seeing a lot of innovation that is retail healthcare, and we think that that's going to continue and it's going to revolutionize the delivery of healthcare. Should be encouraged, and it will bring prices down dramatically. Okay. Well, um, before we get to questions, and, and by the way, um, if you have a question, please line up here and then we can um, give you a chance at the microphone. Um, I'd have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, um, everyone, I think, should have this card. Does everyone have this card? Um, if you do, then we would really love you to um, fill this out. If you don't, then Sean, maybe you can pass them around, but they're just um, for feedback for us. We, we'd love to know what you think about the event. Um, also, this coming Monday, we have another event at the MAC, and it's, um, it's a luncheon event on Monday, and it, it's about uh, the economic debate between bigger government and smaller government, so that's Monday. And also the books, one more time, they're $20, but if you buy them today, they're $15. So, um, and, oh, and I have one question to start off, if you don't mind. Now, in Hawaii, we have, um, you know, we, the state pays for Medicaid, and uh, half, of, half of the bill, I believe, and uh, Medicare somewhat, so does the, uh, increase in costs of Medicaid and Medicare, does that affect the state, does that affect taxpayers as well? Um, so the state doesn't foot any of the bill for Medicare. That's an exclusively federal program. Um, but it's important to note that the government gets money by taxing all of us and by issuing debt. And so increases in federal spending on things comes out of the pockets of the taxpayers. Um, Medicare is a little bit complicated because there are you know, different parts, some of which Part B is funded uh, by contributions from individual beneficiaries, about 25% of the cost, and then the federal government picks up the rest. Um, Medicaid, on the other hand, the costs are shared between the state and the federal government. The exact match is a function of how wealthy the state is. So I don't, off the top of my head, the minimum is 50%, but it's as high as 85% for um, some of the poorer states. Right. Um, but leaving that aside, increases in spending on Medicaid come out of state coffers, and the state obviously has lots of things that it needs to and would like to spend money on. So money spent on Medicaid is money that's not available to spend on schools, um, and on parks and on public safety and on all of the other things. So these are they're very direct fiscal consequences of the inefficiencies of these programs, the fraud, waste, and abuse that we've detailed. Um, so I'll stop. Are there other uh, questions? If you'd like to ask a question, come on up here. I, I have uh, one more question for you. Obamacare. Um, you know, Obama, there's a lot of uh, newsy debate about Obamacare and all that. Is it going to topple in the future? It's kind of toppling as we speak, you know, and, and here I'm not talking about any particular efforts of the Trump administration to kill it. You can't hear. Um, I, I'm really talking about the fact that um, the, in, many, in many counties in the United States, there's only one insurance company that people have to choose from when they go on the exchanges to look for uh, coverage. The prices have gone up uh, quite considerably. Uh, not, not always, there have actually been a few price declines, but overall the price uh, increases have been very sizable. And what we're seeing is more and more people are starting to opt out of that system and become uninsured again. So it's kind of collapsing because if something can't continue forever, it won't. As healthcare keeps getting more and more expensive, insurance has to become more and more expensive because it just has to cover the cost of healthcare. As it gets more and more expensive, it becomes less affordable to people, and so people won't buy it, and so eventually this cycle will end. So I should note that uh, PAPACA, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which goes under a bunch of different names, including Obamacare, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, has a bunch of different parts to it, right? So a big important part of it was the expansion of Medicaid, 
which about two thirds of the states have basically decided to opt into that. And that's had a real beneficial impact of providing coverage to more people. On the other hand, the coverage itself, it, if you're covered by Medicaid but you can't find a physician who's willing to treat you, the value of the coverage is actually not all that high. You can go to an emergency department and you won't get a bill that will ruin your credit rating or force you into bankruptcy. Um, and so there, if people are interested, we can talk about there have been some good empirical studies of the effects of the Medicaid expansion on access to care and um, patients and their health care as well. Um, but Charlie was talking uh, quite accurately about the exchanges, which were a different part of uh, Obamacare. Um, it also included lots of regulation of insurance um, and also the Medicaid expansion. Now, the book is not about Obamacare, right? The book is about the problem of healthcare delivery and healthcare spending. Um, and the, one of the criticisms we make of Obamacare is it didn't really take on the underlying drivers of healthcare spending, it just assumed them as a given and tried to expand coverage, um, which we think is headed in a not helpful direction. Hi, my name is uh, Vincent Davi, and um, I had can cancer of the throat and uh, as you can hear my voice. Anyway, um, I had cancer eight years ago, and I went through um, radiation, and uh, my wife has cancer today, and she's paying $16,000 for Trigriso for 30 pills. We can't afford it. And uh, she just got an okay that she will pay nothing. And uh, I think to Griso, which is uh, coming from an, another country, uh, is, is ripping us off. If you want to stay alive from cancer, then... Uh, then you pay you pay the money, and I think it's a nut. It's nuts. So, uh, what do you think about that? So the book has several chapters on pharmaceuticals. We talked about it uh, today a little bit. Um, pharmaceuticals, the problem that's driving these high prices is there isn't effective competition. Um, and we're not using any of the other strategies that one might use in the absence of effective competition, okay? The pharmaceutical company can pick whatever number it wants, and it can pick a number that's bigger next year than it was this year, and so on indefinitely. And it's not just cancer drugs, although it's a, there's a serious issue with cancer drugs. Insulin, you know, think about that. That drug's been around for 75 years. Right? It's been off patent forever, effectively, but it nonetheless continues to increase in prices. So in the book, we argue that you need different strategies for dealing with branded pharmaceuticals, which are drugs that are still covered by patent protection, versus generics. And we think, as you say, we should prioritize making them cheaper rather than just saying, okay, you want more? Here, we'll write you a check for it. Right? If I negotiated with my dean for my salary the way the pharmaceutical companies negotiate with the rest of us, I'd make a lot more money. Right? It wouldn't matter what number I named, they would just pay me that. Well, you can't do that. Right? No other sector of the economy works that way. The complication with pharmaceuticals is we have to balance affordability against innovation, but we think the balance has gotten way out of whack. And that's part okay. of the reason why we wrote the book. Well, um, we have time for just two more questions here. Um, so, very quickly, you go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, I hate to defend the government or the VA, but I happen to be have been in the use of VA services for 25 years. They run the largest healthcare system in the world, and they're going to have problems. Some of the problems that came up recently about people not making wanting to make appointments, part of that was caused by the VA, but part of it was by caused by people that don't know how to access the system, ignore employment and other things. Another issue that I want to thank the VA for is that our pharmaceutical drugs 
as you know, Medicaid and Medicare cannot de debate or negotiate with the companies individually. About 15, maybe 18 years ago, the VA started buying in bulk from pharmacies. Individual areas couldn't afford it, so one individual center would buy one particular group of medication and they'd spread it out. Saved a lot of money. The other comment I have is that when you cost about, talked about why doctors run so many tests, blame PI attorneys for when they didn't run the tests, then they got sued and not cost more. And then insurance companies, we can get to them too. They are also a profit-making business. And they have a heavy laden bureaucracy. They risk their money sometimes in bad sources, which all cost taxpayers money. The other reason it's more difficult to find physicians that take Medicare and Medicare because they don't pay enough. So when you're standing here and saying to me that they overpay, I don't agree. Is there fraud? Yes. Unbelievable fraud that should be eliminated. But it's also fraud within the insurance industry itself. Thank you. Response? I think there's plenty of blame to go around and we talk about that in the book. We highlighted a couple of things for our presentation today. Um, and the VA, uh, the book talks about their successes as well as their failures. The point that I was making is we have three different programs that are run by the federal government and people's attitudes about them may be different depending upon which of those programs ends up the single payer. Go ahead. I noticed that you didn't mention anything at all about the Canadian system. And I was just wondering if you are pro-Canadian system or anti for any reason. Because I have spoken with a number of Canadians. Anywhere from a farmer, a young farmer in Manitoba to a judge in Vancouver and so forth. Matter of fact, my wife asked me if I was writing a book on the Canadian system. Um, because I enjoy it and, and I enjoy learning about healthcare. But those people in Canada, I have to say, contrary to what we often hear, they are very satisfied with their system, basically overall. And we have had, uh, we've had a few favorable com uh, comments directly from our Canadian friends. Um, sometimes we hear, oh, the Canadians come across the border for surgery. Well, oh, that's their option for something that is relatively minor that they have to wait for, and they don't want to wait because they're wealthy, and they said, I want it done now. That's the only reason that it's done. But I wanted your opinion because, to me, the Canadian system has a lot to be desired in that it is administrated by the Canadian government, but it is taken care of and monitored by each province. Now, why couldn't we do that here in this country and have each state monitor the program that would be set up by the federal government when it reduces the, G, the um, uh, GDP from 18 to 8 percent. So the, if you remember the slide we put up about exploit federalism, that is exactly that suggestion, that individual states ought to be able to try and develop their own strategies. And we'll see which ones work and which ones don't. I will tell you, the Canadians that I meet are lovely people. They're very polite. They like to wait in line. Um, and they're or at least more enthusiastic about doing it than Americans. Um, and so I think importing individual countries wholesale into one another is actually challenging because countries end up with the healthcare they systems they did because of their own history and their own politics, right? Things are different in Hawaii than they are in Nebraska or Illinois or West Virginia. And, and, and that's why you need federalism. No, that's why you need federalism with state control. Well, well we're going to have to end it. We're going to have to end it there. And, and uh, David and Charlie are, are going to be here afterwards. Let's give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for visiting us at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Remember, Monday, we have another one at the MAC. And we have uh, the books here for sale for $15. Thanks again. Thanks.